Ryan, as, as she was mentioning, is gonna be our speaker today. He's gonna to talk about um, buy versus build. Um, for six years, we've been doing this event every Friday, and, and we've had hundreds of talks on entrepreneurship, how people got started. We've actually never had somebody talk about their entrepreneur journey starting with buying a business. And so hearing Brian talk about how and why, and it's gonna be really fascinating, and um, I'll, let, I'll let him tell the story, but I've known Brian for a number of years, and he's always dabbled in marketing and investment, like she was saying, and, and it's always fun to talk, and, and he's a very quiet guy, so you never know what, until you start hearing him talk how much knowledge is there and so it's it's pretty fascinating and I'll share this um, we do this every week because we want to bring the community together and get to know each other and Brian and I would, we would talk every Friday every couple weeks you know just kind of hanging out and one day he says hey uh, do you guys have somebody that's really handling a lot of your pay-per-click advertising uh, and you know for the agency I'm like yeah we've got some people he's like well if you ever need a guy I, I have something that's really good like just and I'm like, oh, we've never actually talked about my business and, and any of that. So cool, I appreciate it. Like, that's awesome you were thinking about that. And, and I really appreciate it. That, was, that, that actually meant a lot to me. And, and for three years now, we've been using the guys over at Convergent Giant as an outsource so for years. So um, you never know. You meet people at these things. You never know what's going to happen. Um, so I'm really excited to have Brian. I've been trying to get him to speak. Actually, I tried to get him to speak on investing um, a year ago. Tried to get him to speak on entrepreneurship and marketing. And he's always kind of been like, ah, I don't know. And he bought a business. Uh, last year and and it's been exciting to sort of hear see on social media what's been going on and so I'm very excited to have him present today his story and his journey brian cambra thank you very much mike those are very kind words i really appreciate that <laughs> um let me get this started uh, well, hello everyone. I'm Brian Canberra. Um, I am the very new, uh, what I, I call myself the managing partner. Other people might call themselves the CEO, but I am the sole owner of Blue Pacific Yachts, a yacht brokerage in Redondo Beach, California. So, um, I started my interest in acquisitions uh, years ago when I worked for a company called Internet Brands. Does anybody know who Internet Brands is? Few, right? So they own every like B grade, high traffic website that you can think of across the internet. They're probably about a $750 million firm, uh, but most people have never heard of them. They have a office down in El Segundo and I started working for them and they would buy websites, bolt those websites onto their uh, proprietary program and put their massive sales force to work on them and make them wildly more profitable than they were previously. This is my first sort of introduction to the power of acquisitions and how people use it for business. Um, so, real quick question. All right, uh, I don't actually know. Is that the right one? Is that the right one? Is that not the one? That's all right. There we go. Okay. Somebody, we'll call somebody out here. And if you want it, I have an old tattered copy of uh, M and A for Dummies. Uh, that whoever answers this correctly can have that copy. Um, so name for me the most valuable textile company. It was purchased in 1965, made on an emotional decision. The person who bought it had no significant management experience whatsoever and no specific industry experience. Anyone, anyone. That guy was up first. Bingo, you can have the book if you want the book. <laughs> Um, so the story is Warren Buffett had started purchasing shares in a textile company called Berkshire Hathaway. Um, the company wanted to buy back some of those shares and the CEO of that company called Warren Buffett and said, you know, hey, how much would you sell me those shares for? They agreed on a price after haggling back and forth a little bit. Um, when the tender offer for the shares came out, it was an eighth of a point below what they had agreed to in their negotiation session. This made Warren Buffett so upset 
that he bought a majority stake in the company, fired the CEO, and took over what we now know today as Berkshire Hathaway. He didn't know anything about the textile industry. He didn't know anything about, um, about managing a large company. And yet, here we are today, and we see this, this giant of industry, Warren Buffett, who built his entire business on acquisitions. Um, I'm sort of just like building uh, a framework here of what the acquisition or entrepreneurship through acquisition uh, space looks like. Um, it was in 1984, uh, Stanford professor H. Grausbeck uh, suggests the idea of what's, what are called search funds. So search funds are an investment fund, usually generally small, that is raised um, to have a single entrepreneur go out and purchase a company in its entirety. Um, so generally they've been like MBA uh, graduates, um, a lot of times out of Stanford. Stanford has a big program, Harvard has a big program, but there are even some people here in Pasadena who do this kind of thing. Um, they generally buy boring companies. Um, Company, and actually, somebody had mentioned on the uh, Meetup page uh, an article that was by Rubeck and Yudkoff on HBR.com. So they actually have a whole book about it. It's called The HBR Guide to Buying a Small Business, where they walk through this whole model of, uh, of search funds and how to form one and what the, what the uh, structure is like and the types of businesses that you want to look for. They generally look for businesses that have recurring revenues, um, are, have some sort of geographic uh, competitive advantage, um, and are generally not going to be taken over by some other larger um, organization, like some sort of massive Google or something like that, right? Um, so sort of it, throughout my little thing here, you'll notice these. These are just little like Easter eggs that I've put in here that are pieces of media that I've taken a lot of uh, valuable information about um, uh, acquisitions in general. Um, this podcast, if you've never heard it, Invest Like the Best, is one of the best investment podcasts that you could possibly listen to. It's amazing. And uh, this is where I came across Adventure.es. Um, so uh, they are a small, they focus on acquiring small um, family-run businesses typically with EBITDA in the range of, let's call it one to $10 million. And they've built a portfolio that includes a pool builder, a recruiting company, a manufacturing company, um, and just recently closed a $50 million round um, on an investment fund uh, to continue their sort of operations. What they do, essentially, is locate the company, provide finance and marketing expertise, but otherwise the companies run themselves. And this kind of structure is actually really similar to the way that many successful CEOs have run massive organizations, including Berkshire Hathaway, um, uh, Taladyne. Uh, there's a whole list of them. So, so now let's bring this to you buying your business. Um, it's sort of like in, in exploring purchasing a business, um, what I've discovered, if you take about, let's call it three years worth of your personal income, so like let's say you make $60,000 a year, right? If you were to save uh, $180,000, you would likely be able to purchase a business that would replace your your annual income with cash flow from that business, right? So think about that. Like, how much time have people spent trying to build a business that could hopefully replace their income when you could really just go to work, get all of your comfy benefits, take vacation, live your life, save enough money so that you just buy your way out of the rat race? <laughs> 
Um, and there are a lot of resources out there. Bizben.com is actually where I found my business. Um, it's a website that focuses specifically on businesses for sale within California. Um, it, tricky thing, well actually we'll move on to the next point because we're going to talk about this. Um, so choose your adventure. Uh, this is the first step in buying your business, right? What kind of business is going to make you happy? If you're going to, you know, be, you're because once you buy this business, you're stuck in it. There's no out. There's no like, oh, I, I don't really want to do this. Um, you probably have employees. You probably have uh, contracts with people. Like you're buying into something that is a going concern, and there's no out. So you better pick something that makes you at least moderately happy. Um, what skills do you already have that will contribute to the business, right? So what do you, what do, you do right now? Um, so in my case, I was a marketing executive for small, primarily digital companies. Um, and so the idea of working with a sales organization like the yacht brokerage that I purchased was pretty, it, it was pretty natural for me. Um, but then you might say, you know, maybe you do more administrative tasks. Um, how could you apply those administrative tasks that you do at your current job to the business that you intend to buy? And those are the ways that you're going to use your skills to improve the company that you purchase. Um, in my case, it was sales and marketing. Um, it just made a whole lot of sense for me to go into something and start working on improving their sales and marketing. Um, and what are your long-term plans for the business, right? So where do you want to go? Um, there's probably people out here who want to build an app, right? Well, I mean, a great place to start with that might be, well, I'm going to buy an app building company, right? That's what they do. They generate cash flow from building apps. And then I'm going to use those resources to build the app that I want rather than going from, well, I'm going to figure out how to code. I'm going to go try and convince somebody to be my technical founder. I'm going to go uh, try and convince somebody to buy my company, like a part of my company that doesn't have any revenue. Um, and, then, and then maybe we'll get this app together. Buy a company that has cash flow, that has the resources that you need already, and use those resources. Because this is, this is ultimately what business is. It's building assets. And, and expanding those assets through management, right? And, and this is a great way to get you directly to that point. And once you have that website business, that, that app building business, use the extra time to build the app that you want. Use the, the resources that are available within your business. Organize them better to do what you also want to do. So uh, next step. Deal flow. So, okay, now I want to buy a business. I know what kind of business I want to buy generally. Um, well, how do I find businesses? Well, so I had previously mentioned um, bizben.com. There's also bizbysell. There's also a ton of business brokers out there that you can speak to. Um, who don't necessarily have everything on the websites. Uh, a lot of business brokers, I would say, are not super technically savvy. Some of them are, some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. Um, so contacting business brokers, and, and really you have two decisions to make here in your search for a business. Um, do you want to work with a broker deal, right? So do you want to work with a broker on your deal? Ultimately, that broker has to get paid. So you're going to pay a little bit of a premium for that. And there's also the possibility that a lot of the broker deals, the reason they're broker deals is because they've already been shopped to the industry and nobody in the industry wanted that deal, right? So <laughs> uh, you can rest assured that most of the people in the industry have already heard about that deal before you saw it on bizben.com. <laughs> doesn't mean it's all bad, because brokers can be really helpful. Um, they, they, and I mean, I bought a brokerage, so I'm obviously a fan of the brokerage model. <laughs> so they act as that, that midpoint who wants to get the deal done, but is trying to be fair to both sides. 
And that can be really helpful. In my case, uh, our broker on our deal uh, was actually a yacht broker at another point in her career. And so she knew the industry, she knew some of the things that I should be looking for, and she helped guide me through that process of getting involved in yacht brokerage. Um, and I would say that was an invaluable relationship. The other option that you have, and I'm sort of working this angle now as I continue to try to find more companies to acquire, is the proprietary angle. So finding companies on your own that maybe haven't even thought about selling yet, and, and convincing them that they want to sell their business, or sometimes you have to convince, sometimes you don't. Sometimes they come to you. Um, and, and doing that deal yourself, right, without the help of a broker. This is actually where you're gonna find the best deals. How am I doing on time, by the way? Good, okay. Uh, this is how you're gonna find the best deals, right? Because occasionally there are those people out there that think, oh, nobody's gonna wanna buy my business. Like it's, you know, I got this problem, I got this problem, I got that problem, and, but they're, and they're weighed down by the fact that there is no out, right? And somebody comes along and they say, hey, you got a cool little business there. I wanna buy your business. But what they don't see is that a lot of their problems, and this is true of all businesses, a lot of their problems they created themselves. And now that you come in from the outside, you can easily go, wow, why are you paying uh, Bob over there so much money? It seems like Bob doesn't even really do anything. Oh, well, you know, Bob is, is uh, my wife's brother, and, and he's pretty helpful and stuff, and right? Well, wow, I just saved myself $100,000 a year because I just fired Bob. <laughs> right? The truth does come out. There are... One of the most common things that everybody says when you talk about buying a business, like 100%, and probably like half, who, uh, tell me, how many people were thinking about this before we even walked in here? Well, why are they selling? Doesn't it mean there's something wrong? Right? Yes, there's something wrong. There's always something wrong. The, uh, a $10 million firm, why is that $10 million firm not a $100 million firm? Why is that $100 million firm not a billion dollar firm? It's because of their problems. It's because of the things that they haven't solved yet. So every company that you look at is going to have problems. The question is, can you find the answer to their problems? And if you can, then you've found the key to unlocking the value in that business. Uh, valuation. I talked about EBITDA. Um, so there's a few different ways to value a business. Um, one would be comps, so what are other businesses selling for, you know, relative to that business. Um, the other would be basically like replacement value. What would it cost me to build this business from scratch? A lot of times people will do that with asset-based businesses. Um, if you've got a lot of heavy machinery or something like that. Broadly, people use earnings before interest tax depreciation and, and amortization. Which essentially means before I pay my taxes, my note on the company, and, uh, and remove any depreciation expense, like how much money is this thing making? How much money does it have for me to lever up and, and put a loan against, right? If, if you're, uh, well, anyways, do we get that? We get that. Oh, so most small businesses the majority of small businesses are going to sell for between three and five times EBITDA. If you, go, if you come across a company that is, let's call it $5 million in earnings, and they tell you, well, and, and unless they are like really like a hot ticket, and they tell you, well, I want 10 times earnings, run. No company that small deserves that kind of valuation unless you can be so certain <laughs> that, that they are the next Google that you're like, oh, I gotta have this. I gotta have this. Like, this is the best thing, the best thing coming. Because somewhere out there is a very similar company that will sell for three to five times EBITDA. Most businesses don't sell, period. And a lot of times it's because people overvalue them. But of course, it's ours. Right? I built this thing, it's my baby. I want as much money as I can get for it. Well, it's not worth that, sorry. Uh, negotiation, okay, so you found the business that you want, 
you've sourced the business that you want, and now you need to start figuring out, okay, like what am I actually gonna pay for this? Because the offer price is not the actual price that you're gonna pay. Nobody ever, well, that's not true, because you wanna have an idea of what the value of that business is to you. That way you can say realistically, and realistically say, well, how much do you want to sell your business for? Well, I want to sell it for $200,000, right? Well, I've previously valued that business at $240,000. That's what it's worth to me. And you're saying 200,000? Awesome. We're not going to negotiate on price anymore. We're going to negotiate on all the other factors that are involved in doing the deal for this business, right? How much, uh, how much of the sale price is the owner going to carry? Right, this, this is pretty common that owners would carry a note on their business. How much of the sale price are they going to carry? What's the interest rate gonna be on that? Um, how long are they gonna carry that note? Um, what assets come with it? How long is the owner going to stay involved in the company? Um, is there maybe a way that you could uh, structure an earnout so that rather than paying them a fixed amount, uh, you're paying them a percentage of profit. This is a great way to ensure that the owner stays vested in the business and isn't just gonna like take off and say, all right, sorry buddy, like best of luck, right? Keep them involved in the business. And these are the things that you wanna start working on during the, during the negotiation. Oh, by the way, uh, Jim Radcliffe, this is this guy right here, uh, richest person in the UK, started building his business at 40. Um, they buy uh, businesses that, like big blue chip companies, are spinning off, right? Those companies have decided, you know, this is just like right now GE. GE has a bunch of businesses that they're like, this just isn't core to us. This isn't what we do. We need to focus, right? So they have parts of their business that are up for sale. If they have something that relates to chemicals, that guy probably would want to do it. He was a chemical engineer um, and got into the chemical business. His largest acquisition was uh, BP Chemicals. It, I think it probably made their company 10 times larger than it was when they made the acquisition. Uh, due diligence. Due diligence is a presentation on its own. Um, this is when I figure out how, what's, what, this is when I start trying to figure out what is wrong with this company? What is good with this company? Um, what kind of contracts do they have? Uh, have they had any employment disputes? Have they had any tax disputes? Are they currently being sued? Um, if they have contracts, are the contracts filled out in a way that those contracts are enforceable? Um, are, are the revenue numbers that they're presenting to me in the P&L that they have provided accurate? Um, you know, people, you're, you're going to buy a business and they're going to say, all right, here's, here's my financials for the previous three years, right? And you go, oh, wow, great, this is a very beautiful spreadsheet. I don't actually know that any of this is true, right? How do I verify it? I go back to the tax, the, the um, uh, tax statements. I go to the bank account. And this is a, this is, sellers are going to be hesitant in this situation because you're basically saying, I want you to show me everything. Every mistake that you've ever made, I want to look at it. Every problem you've ever had, I want to know about it. And I'm going to dig through, like every time you expensed a lunch that wasn't actually a business lunch, I'm going to try and find that. And I'm going to use that in the course of our negotiations. Um, so, my business was fairly simple. Um, I don't actually have any employees besides myself. Everybody else is an independent contractor. Um, my overhead is fairly low, and I don't have a whole lot of long-term contracts. Um, it could be some other like small businesses that you might look at. A uh, really common one is like liquor stores. 
Um, you've got issues with inventory. Um, you've got issues with contracts with suppliers. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on with due diligence. And the problem is you're going to make mistakes, especially if it's your first business. Like there are things that I know for sure now, after having bought my business, that I didn't look at that I should have. I didn't know how to evaluate the quality of the listings that my brokerage had. I didn't know how to how to value the length of term, the length of time on the contracts that we had. Um, I know that now, or the importance of meeting with these independent contractor salespeople. Um, sellers aren't going to want to give that stuff away. They're not going to want to give you essentially ammo for you to negotiate with them on. Um, and so it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle back and forth. But at some point, you have to figure out what's really important to me. Financing. All right, so I found this business. I've done the due diligence. I really like it. Um, this business is great. Uh, or if it's not great, it's good enough. Um, how am I going to pay for it? Right. Um, I, I am a big fan of of levering. Like, yeah, it's great if you buy something cash. Um, and my wife will totally disagree with me on this one. But I put some debt on it. Right. It's going to magnify your returns. Um, but how do you do that? Right. Banks suck. Wells Fargo, Chase. Um, any sort of major bank that you can think of, they have no interest in giving you a, a uh, small business loan. Um, but an existing business with cash flow has value. And that, that value, uh, so what you want to do is actually talk to, um, they have like community development companies. Um, that work with small business owners. Um, and uh, there's a company, there's a lot of companies out there that will finance small businesses that aren't banks. You just have to look for them. Actually, you can go to the SBA, they'll give you a whole list of them, and everybody will send you things that says, hey, we want to finance you. We want to fi you just got to call them all. All right, I'm speeding it up. Professionals, lawyers and accountants. Um, the quality of lawyers varies quite a bit. Um, I was not happy, actually, with some of the contract work that the lawyer that we got involved in our deal did. Um, but uh, he was a specialist in the field and understood a lot of the things that are involved in it. If you can find a lawyer that specializes in the type of business that you're interested in, that's really good. Um, accountants. Accountants for small businesses, they are important, but there's not a whole lot they're going to be able to do for you during the 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 acquisition stage, besides maybe evaluating the uh, the financials and doing what they call a quality of earnings statement, are the earnings that they're reporting tr true and accurate? What is the quality of the earnings that they're reporting? Uh, Two types of purchases. You can buy the shares of the corporation, or you can buy the assets of the corporation. Generally, people prefer to buy just the assets because you're not taking any of the history of the corporation with you. But there are instances, such as in my deal, where you have a lot of contracts where you're going to want to buy the shares of the corporation. The shares of the corporation uh, mean that you don't have to change the name on anything. Right? If I buy the assets, I now have to take my corporation that I formed to put the assets into and put that name onto all of the contracts or, or agreements that I have with anyone. Um, buying shares, it's really just a change of leadership. Don't even have to do anything with the state besides file a statement of information, which is free as long as you do it before the required date. Um, it's your problem now. The problems in the business, if you don't like what's going on in the business, it's your problem. Fix it. Right? If you're not happy with the way things are, well, how are you going to change it? Because it's no longer your boss's fault. You can't go, oh, well, that guy, blah, 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 blah. Well, if that guy's not doing it, it's your responsibility to train him to make him do it. Or get him out. But it is now your problem. And 
you know, there are a lot of business owners that I think feel weighed down by their business because they don't focus on that fact that ultimately it's their responsibility to build the business that they want. And if they're not, then they need to make changes. Uh, people and culture. Huh? People and culture, and this is really the key. The difference between building a business and, and trying to get from zero to something is you're buying a culture and people. I mean, you're not buying the people, but you're buying a whole lump of problems and good, good aspects. And being able to manage people well, to work with them well, to, uh, to recruit people who are going to make your business better, to, um, to know what, what is a good and a bad boss, right? If I've got, you know, if I come into work every day and I'm like, right? I think it's just me, but when you own the company, everybody takes that tone from you. They go, oh, the boss is upset today. Don't mess with him, right? And so they're not going to come to you with problems, and they're not going, and they're going to feel like, oh man, if I go to the boss, he's going to be pissed off. You know, you have to create the culture from the top, and that's that is so much tr so true when you buy a business. And you're buying a business that maybe didn't have the same culture that you want, and so you actually have to go through the process of trying to change that culture and build it into a culture that is growth-focused, positive, remove some of the bad aspects. And that can be really difficult. That, that is always a challenge in any business, and you're buying your way right into all of those issues. Um, this is my last slide. Versus, versus build, right? Start at zero, best of luck. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Uh, before we open up to Q&A, um, microphone's there. We're gonna, so we'll hand the microphone to John. Uh, if you've got a question about buy versus build, you know, any questions for, for Brian, ask them. If you've got some comments about a business that you saw for sale, we're not really interested in hearing about it right now, to be honest. Um, so uh, actually, I'd like to start. Can you tell us a little bit about your decision? So when I first heard about you buying this yacht business, I was like, whoa, that's cool. Like, why did you buy a yacht business? Because, whoa, that's cool. <laughs> uh, well, no, OK, so specifically, um, I saw a business that relative to a lot of the other businesses that were on the market was um, was more profitable than many. Let's put it that way. Um, but as I looked into the market, uh, it's a highly fragmented market where the the largest players in the industry only have like 35% market share. It's a fairly small market. The used boat market is $11 billion, which I mean, yeah, like that's a lot of money. But in the relative scope of things, $11 billion really isn't that much. I mean, there's hedge funds bigger than that. Um, and, uh, and the location. The location was pretty awesome. I mean, I was looking at like laundromats and smoke shops and things like that. And then I went down to Redondo Beach and I was like, wait, that's my office? <laughs> yeah, babe, I want this. <laughs> um, so that, that is, that, there was some financial aspects and there was also a certain amount of like, it's cool. <laughs> Yes. Uh, a, a new friend of mine has uh, sort of uh, concentrated on two aspects, and I wondered if you'd agree with him or not. Uh, uh, a person uh, like myself that uh, was a baby boomer, it, it, there's a lot of businesses out there that are being sold to the next generation. And he, he, he adds on the, uh, the fact that some companies aren't technologically quite as advanced as they should be. And, and so with those two, he's really going after a number of uh, companies. Do you think that's a fairly good idea? I 100% agree. Oh, thank you. Um, the amount of businesses that are being sold by uh, people who are at the retirement age, um, or even a little early, because they've made you know pretty good money, um, as it, there's a lot of them. And, uh, and in general, uh, companies get stuck in their technology, right? And, and it becomes a bit of a hassle to try to upgrade everything, especially as you get a little bit bigger. Um, and so if you're willing to do that work, 
uh, there's definitely a value add there. Hi, I was curious about um, looking on Craigslist. I was wondering what your advice would be in terms of all the businesses for sale on Craigslist. Like, what? How do you tell just at the start what is a good deal or not, or what would you do? Uh, so I never really even looked at Craigslist, um, but I mean, what I'm going to look at initially is what's their revenue, what's their net, um, what's their location. Right? Does it work for me location-wise? Uh, and then you just make a phone call. Right, like you, you just kind of set up. Uh, like I, I generally had a, a net profit hurdle, right? I wanted to see a certain amount of net profit because I knew I could get that out of you know multiple investments that are, were available to me, and I just looked for the ones that had that information, and you just start filtering out, and you've got to make the phone calls. At the end of the day, it is a very personal process, and ideally, you want to talk to the owner as soon as possible, even though a lot of times brokers will not. Uh, they don't want you to do that per se, but that's kind of where you want to get to so you can have a heart to heart. Hi, thank you for the presentation. You spoke earlier about the seller slash owner and their level of involvement and a fixed price versus profit sharing model. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you'd talk about what it is the seller's doing because I thought you were buying the company. <laughs> right. Um, so there, there's a couple ways you can look at it. This um, there's what people call a recapitalization, where somebody comes in and buys a portion of a business, so that the owner can get cash out, and the owner even stays on board many times. Right? They continue to work at the business. The the your percentage ownership means you get the revenues and all the bills. Right, and so maybe at some point I want to take some risk off the table. Um, the owner, it, generally, they're not going to stay around for a long time. Um, but like the owner from my business, uh, she's sticking around for 18 months, and she's going to continue to sell boats with us throughout her retirement. Um, it just so happens that like selling boats is really fun, and nobody ever actually really retires. <laughs> but the the issues of dealing with the business dealing with the people issues, dealing with the bills, like having all of that responsibility, it's really great to take that off of your plate at some point. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, to expand on that a little, I ran across a TV show called The Profit on CNBC a few years ago with Marcus Limonis, essentially coming in, doing all the research, and buying a piece of a business, right-siding it and moving on. And I'm curious if you can leverage off of that to discuss what that model might also look like in terms of not just buying it outright and pushing the owner out six months, a year, two years later, but fixing those businesses. Because a lot of the problem is, yeah, we need Cousin Bob out of there, and that's the big problem. And for a small amount of money, I can buy a piece, get Bob out, and then suddenly this business is doing really well, but I don't need to actually own all of it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So the Marcus Lemonis' model is he's essentially buying uh, distressed companies, uh, rehabbing the distressed companies, and and getting them right. Uh, I mean, it's all the concept of investment, right? A business is just an asset, and I own a certain percentage of that. My Involvement or non-involvement is really just a contractual agreement between the people who have who are involved in the business, and uh, and myself. Right? If I'm the sole owner, I could hire somebody else to run the whole company. He has no interest in it whatsoever. But maybe I'm paying him well enough that it's worth it. Right? There are a lot of businesses out there that are like that. I mean, you could go on a buying spree of like gas stations, and you're never going to see the owner in the gas station. Right? But somebody's running the gas station. There's a general manager that does, and he probably gets paid fairly well to do that. You could do the same thing with an owner of any kind of company, really. You could come along and say, hey, look, um, you know, I want to buy your company. I'm going to give you a bunch of cash to, to buy 90% of your company. And, but I want you to stay on and run the company. And I'm going to pay you 40% uh, of net to run the company. Well, now he just took a bunch of risk off of his plate and said, wait, so I, I make almost as much money as I used to make, but I have half as much risk and I still have some equity? Good deal. 
right? I mean, that's, that's essentially what it is. And that's how you get creative with these types of things. That's what private equity does. Private equity doesn't run companies. They consult with companies, but they come in and they buy the company. They buy a percentage of the company and they leave, oftentimes leave the CEO or put their own CEO in place to run the company. Many times those CEOs have equity in the company as well. Thank you. Um, so thanks for all the great tips, really enjoy it. So how well are you doing? How do you know? Because maybe I want to go hang out at the Yacht Club too. <laughs> um, well, how, how well am I doing? Uh, so this is still the slow season for boating. Um, we're basically like break even since, uh, since we took over in November. Um, but things are starting to pick up as the season uh, comes in. The, this, my industry is very seasonal. Um, you're probably going to see 65 to 75 percent of your revenue during the middle three months, so like June, July, and August. Um, so that's when we really make our money. Um, but how, how am I doing overall? I like the direction that we're going. Um, there's a few things that I use to measure our success. One is my bank account. Um, the other <laughs> is the number of listings that we have. Um, and the other is, are we recruiting new salespeople consistently in, in new areas? Because if you're a good business that's presenting itself well, then people will want to work with you. If we're not recruiting people and we're not recruiting quality people, there's something wrong, right? For whatever reason, we're putting off an image that people aren't, aren't buying into. And, and somehow I have to, to resolve that, right? So um, I mean, we do have a, a, a new salesperson coming on soon. And um, I'm excited to see what he does. He's going to focus on sport fishing boats. And a um, uh, fairly successful guy in his own right. So I'm interested to see what he does with boats. So hi, Brian. Thank you for this question. Is Yacht brokerage, the thing that now you want to do for the rest of your life until you retire and sell that business, or is this the first of a portfolio of businesses you're going to acquire to create sort of your own version of Berkshire Hathaway? Um, so it is the first of a portfolio of businesses that I will acquire over the course of many years. Um, it's pretty likely, so the way I've put it, uh, or the way I'm thinking about it right now, I need about three companies my size to get to a scale that I'd really be happy with, um, or one more that's just a lot bigger than me. Um, but, but that's where I'm looking at it. So I, I'd like to get to a scale where I'm comfortable within uh, yacht brokerage. Um, so that I have a little bit of economy of scale to do more of the things that I'd like to do. But then I might branch out into some surrounding businesses, uh, boat maintenance, um, manufacture, um, it, what other options are there? Uh, there's, I mean, there's a whole <laughs> uh, uh, boat financing. Um, I mean, there, there's just a whole bunch of different angles that you can work off of, off, really off of anything, right? Um, you know, if I buy a, uh, a smoke shop, well, maybe the next thing that I buy is uh, a manufacturing company that is making my goods so that I can offer unique things at my store to improve the quality of my store and my overall revenue. So I actually have th uh, three kinds of related questions. The sure. uh, first one is, what does a broker charge for uh, broking a business? 10%. Okay. Um, secondly, the point out the difference between owning a job and owning a business. Ah. <laughs> and the third thing is, of the, the companies that are out for, there for sale, how many have really unhappy employees that are really, really badly run? Oh, well, let's start with owning a job versus owning a business. Um, so owning a job is the business owners that I was talking about who feel weighed down by, by the work that they have to do. They haven't put the necessary level of management and, uh, and process in place so that they can really step out of their business and let their business run as an asset. Where, 
you have to create a process that works on its own and grows on its own, where you're able to at least somewhat step out of that business and go, you know what, if I walk away for a month, this thing's still going to be here, and it might even be bigger than when I left. And still making money. Yes, absolutely. And still making money. Um, and that comes down to having the right people, having the right processes, and building all of that out so that you're capable of doing that. Um, a lot of employees are unhappy uh, in general. Um, I would say that unhappy employees, I, I couldn't give you a percentage or something like that, but. Um, Businesses with unhappy employees are probably selling more often than businesses with happy employees, I would guess. Um, but there's always a certain amount of unhappiness. Um, the company that I bought, and generally people were kind of happy with it, but as, as time went by, like the, the undercurrent of the relationships that people have sort of bubbles to the surface and you go, oh wow, like turns out that person was not as nice as they appeared on the outside. And a lot of times people won't tell you they're unhappy if you're just buying the business because they know that, look, this guy could go away. I don't even know that, I don't know who you are. I don't trust you. Why would I confide in you about my issues at work? Um, so it would be hard for me to put a number on people who are unhappy. Um, but it's probably a lot because a lot of people are unhappy with work. <laughs> even as like a, a just people's relationship with authority is very, like a lot of times it's very uh, contentious, right? Like it doesn't matter if you're a nice person or, or a, a bad person. My relationship with my father means that I'm always going to look at you as this kind of guy. <laughs> and that's not actually your fault. Um, over here. Okay. I'm just uh, wondering. If you created an exit strategy, I, I find a lot of small businesses, um, they, they don't want to continue what they're doing, but they haven't created an exit strategy, and, and if they're family owned, uh, if they had thought of that up front and it was on the table, everyone would be better about the transition. And just for yourself, do you have an exit strategy for leaving this company or selling it? Um, I do not have an exit strategy at this point. Honestly, my, my goal would be to create essentially a permanent capital structure, ideally where I'm building a business to hold for a lifetime. Um, short of, I mean, eventually I want to uh, <laughs> manage my way out of my own business and let other people run that for me. And, you know, assuming somebody doesn't come along and say, like, hey, I'm going to give you a ridiculous amount of money for this company, I don't have specific exit strategies per se. Um, but ultimately, I would just go about it the same way that I bought my business. I would talk to people in the industry. I would uh, maybe put it on a listing site. And I would start talking to people about, like, hey, is this, you know, something you might be interested in owning? And, well, and then doing all of the work that it takes to put together a good presentation for sale. Right? I can say, hey, I want to sell my business, but do I have three years financials? Do I have my, my taxes? Do I have a business that is transferable? Um, and that's just a process that I think you can start, you know, start a year out and then you know, put together a presentation and then just start talking to people about it. But I'm not getting out. <laughs> Uh, Brian, one more question. Yes. Uh, first of all, thanks for the shout out earlier. Uh, yes, I do work at a community development financial institution. I do manage the lending department. So if anybody's looking for a loan, uh, you can come talk to me. Um, <laughs> Valerie is question. La Valerie is a, uh, a loan broker. So um, just wanted to give a sh uh, acknowledge any other lenders in the audience. You go ahead, raise your hand, and, and if anybody is looking for uh, a loan, then you guys can uh, approach them. I love but you, community the development people, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, we're the alternative to the banks. Uh, but the question is, as an ex-banker that used to uh, finance uh, leverage buyouts, LBOs, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this information that you presented today was very spot on. Um, okay. I think that the, uh, the the due diligence part, when you identified uh, the yacht bro broker that you um, decided that you wanted to buy, can you talk a little bit about um, how difficult that was, how long it took, the negotiation process before you finally uh, closed that deal? Uh, it took us, I want to say six months from 
maybe five months from the identification point saying like, okay, this is something I'm interested in, exploring it a little bit further, um, and then getting through all of the due diligence and the negotiations and um, let's see, what I'm trying to think that, well, and then <laughs> mistakes made. We originally structured it as an asset sale and that is the wrong way to buy a brokerage because brokerages are primarily contracts and that would require us to go back to all of our customers, all of our independent contractors and rewrite those contracts. And so we then had to restructure the sale as, as a share sale. Um, so that extended the, the period that it took. And then the seller was getting married in the middle of it. So that, that slowed us down a little bit too. <laughs> Always the important question to ask, are you getting married? <laughs> I'm about to buy your business. Thanks, Brian. Really appreciate it. This was fantastic. 